All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. Uh, today we have the son of Korg and Ezekiel 73 with us today, two mysterious men uh, that run a mysterious blog called Limited Hangout uh, WTF. Uh, and I stumbled upon their blog when I saw a few people uh, being linked to my newsletter uh, from it. Uh, and as I was mentioning, one of their uh, postings, I imagine, and I started reading it and I was like, what is this? Some uh, intense rabbit holes were abound. And uh, after looking to them, I noticed they were interviewed by our, our friend, Layman Pascal of the Integral Sage. Um, and what's cool about them, they uh, both, both Ezekiel and Korg have a, a background in uh, integral theory and in the strange world of parapolitics. So parapolitics or deep politics is, is basically hidden politics. Uh, like the political machinations that happen outside of surface politics. And it's a real tricky thing to sense make, as you can imagine. Um, it gets into pretty uh, weird uh, territory uh, fast, and which I mentioned we'll get to uh, today. Uh, and we had the man who actually coined the term, Peter Dale Scott, on the STOA uh, last year in September. And a lot of Patrick Ryan stuff, if you know Patrick Ryan from the Dark STOA, uh, has a lot of uh, interesting parapolitical takes, but we never explicitly had a session on parapolitics here at the STOA, so I'm quite excited about this session. Uh, how it's going to work, uh, I'm going to tag in uh, uh, the son of Korg and Ezekiel uh, 73 in a moment, and uh, they will present um, for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a uh, Q&A. We're here for about 75 to 90 minutes in total, but if you have any questions anytime, just throw them in the chat. I'll call on you, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Um, so that's it on my end. Uh, so gentlemen, uh, I don't know who I'm taking in, but welcome to the STOA. Oh, this is uh, Son of Korg and thanks Peter and thanks everyone here at the um, STOA for having us. We're really excited to be here. So let's see if I can do this old screen share. Yeah, perfect. Um, so our topic today is sense making the parapolitical. I'm son of Korg or Korg uh, for short on this project. That's me there with the beanie <laughs> and uh, partner in crime is uh, Zeke, Zeke Gil 73, who's there with uh, Sasquatch and the UFO and all the fun. So we like to have both a serious aspect as we'll get into, there's some sober stuff that we'll get into critical grounded but also with a bit of humor and lightheartedness because it's um yeah some interesting terrain that we're heading into so and uh people ask us often why we do kind of the slightly you know the, the pseudonyms and the imagery and a little bit of the hiddenness partly it's to avoid some of the because we talk about some controversial stuff partly to avoid some of the cancel culture and some of the gnarlier aspects of online world. And part of it, I think, is also aesthetic, as we often say, and the nature of this topic, it kind of works with it. So that's part of the, the fun and the play in that. So a few words of caution intro as we, we get into this. Um, we're not going to go into, quote unquote, that topic, <laughs> aka the last two years. Uh, we're guests here and we don't want to get the Stoa shadow band on our first <laughs> opportunity being here. That would be poor uh, guest ethics. So we're going to offer a template to start to sense, make and think in the parapolitical, which will use historical examples of the various scenarios we're going to talk about today. But you can certainly apply that template to any present phenomena or potentially future phenomena. And if you want to get, yeah, you know, ask us questions directly, our emails are there and we're happy to, to dialogue. So a little bit of forewarning that we uh, are heading into some territory with some dragons. And the discussion will look soberly and critical, critically at some issues that can be pretty emotionally and psychologically jarring. And it is, I think of it as very much an initiatory journey. The whole famous metaphor is rabbit holes, going down rabbit holes, which of course is a reference to Alice. 
in Wonderland, which is after all a kind of shamanic journey into the underworld and back. Um, so this entry into the parapolitical, if one goes deep enough down it, is really a kind of a transformational journey. And so we have a piece there that kind of explores that and the emotional impact. So we talk often about staying grounded, being you know at ease while dealing with some challenging subject matter for sure lest we become like our archetype <laughs> on the screen this is not the this is the classic meme scenario we got in play here so um we're not looking to become like that but we are going to be dealing with some of the stuff that is the tendrils underneath the surface as peter was saying so first we want to define our terms um WTF, which is the, the dot WTF of our site, which we just kind of think of as a perfect metaphor for the present moment, it's a lot of WTF. So the term parapolitical, the analog is the word paranormal. And studies of the paranormal, as you'll see, immediately lead to the parapolitical and study of the parapolitical inevitably lead to studies of the paranormal. So they're twins to each other, but Para means, literally means alongside of or next to. So paranormal as a term treats various psi uh, capacities, psychic capacities, non-ordinary experience as alongside of or next to normal experience. So it's often a corner somewhere, either to be debunked by skeptics or to be sort of naively believed by many of its adherents with potentially weird interpretations on top of it. But the paranormal is not really paranormal, it's rather weirdly normal. It's the weird aspects of the normal, and we have a larger understanding of the normal or the natural. And by parallel then, or extension, the parapolitical is not really alongside of or next to the normal political process. It's rather the weird, eerie, occulted political, economic, and social reality. It's weirdly normal. And it's a mostly hidden portion of the political. So it's part of the game, but it's typically pretty opaque or occulted, hence the sense-making aspect that we will get to. But first, Zeke, you want us to give us a little more on the who's and the elements and the various kinds of players and characters we might see in the parapolitical or where we might want to look? Yeah, absolutely. So as you can see here, um, there's a huge uh, nexus of force, interrelated forces. It's been called an octopus before. Intelligence agencies, covert military operations. Uh, you can see the list. I think uh, organized crime is an, is an is an important one. Uh, major media conglomerates, foundations, academia, so on and so forth. You have a term um, such as uh, regu regulatory capture or the revolving door that's often um, uh, the people on the left have spoken about for a long time. That kind of talks about this, this network. You think about someone just before the um, uh, W. Bush administration, Dick Cheney is the CEO of Halliburton, uh, Donald Rumsfeld is at a major pharmaceutical company and whatnot. So, and, and those kind of connections could be made, made all day. So there's, there's a whole variety uh, uh, of, of, yeah, a big nexus of, of different uh, entities and arenas. Yeah, and then also the point about the internal contradictions and potential fights between the groups. It's not in sort of, you know, classic imagery, there's often it's like the pyramid and everybody's like, who's the exact person on top? But if we actually think of it like Peter Dale Scott, Peter, Peter mentioned, um, you know, he talked about it more like almost like a weather system, like it's a series of kind of interrelated forces that can move back and forth. So if we get that view in our mind, it can be helpful. Um, examples we have on the screen are like cartel or like mafia, five families. So they can organize around various topics, but that might not preclude internal contradiction or infighting either. Absolutely, it's not monolithic. Yeah, absolutely. So that's 
a very brief intro as compared to our earlier slide of sunny, always sunny in Philadelphia <laughs> with the rabbit holes and the threads on the wall. I would prefer we think more in terms of this guy who's part of the Hong Kong protests and his fight against being brainwashed. So the direct element that we're going to use to really start to sense make in the parapolitical is the topic of worldview warfare, or AKA psychological operations, AKA psyops. So this is gonna be our frame or our entry point. And then we're gonna go into various tactics of worldview warfare, but first we need to define what that is and then some tactics and how to spot them and some historical examples. So the term is originally Nazi in origin, which ought to clue you in, clue us in right away that it's not a no bueno, um, but translated into English usually as psychological operations or psyops for short. But the literal translation is in fact worldview warfare. And if we define sense making as our worldview orientation or fundamental perspective, then worldview warfare would consist of warfare on our ability to make sense of life and our experience. And for those who might be interested, there's a sort of the larger theoretical backdrop to our talk today as a piece um, that explores John Boyd's theory of OODA loops in relationship to this topic. And if there's time and the question time and everybody wants to ask about that, that could be a fun one. But um, that's for those who want to do a deeper dive. That's the link there. Zeke, you want to talk about how we're distinguishing worldview warfare from classic forms of propaganda? Yeah, I mean, you can, um, propaganda, I mean, they're, they're intimately related, but propaganda goes back a, a long way. I mean, it was, uh, the Assyrians had great reliefs built in their cities of, of their conquests and, you know, with people on spikes and all kinds of things. Uh, the Romans had a, you know, the emperor cult was throughout the Roman empire. Every town had on its coins, but on buildings. And so propaganda, uh, very old. So is spycraft. Um, Sun Tzu wrote about the five spies. And so that kind of thing, um, that's all very old. What, what we'll get into later is we're talking about, yes, a modern scientific uh, managerial approach to this topic and, and really a 20th century where we humans learned a lot more about ourselves and that knowledge gets weaponized as we'll see later on. So it's a more sophisticated um, um, version with a lot more knowledge of the human psyche. Absolutely. So the sense-making aspect in part, what we're seeking to offer is almost the kind of defensive strategy, how to recognize possibilities that we might all be having our minds played with a bit and how to see through some of that deception and illusion. So there is a personal element amidst what is here, the political. So worldview warfare tactics and how to spot them, which is the bulk of what we're gonna talk about here. Um, list is not exhaustive, but representative. And we're gonna give a number of examples. And each one of those is kind of its own set of rabbit holes, if you will, that we could all go down. So just know we're kind of touching the surface here of a whole series of possibilities. Parapolitical involves more than worldview warfare, but worldview world warfare psyops are absolutely critical to the parapolitical, particularly the parapolitical or the shadow state gains power by remaining in the shadows. So one of the most important aspects of this form of uh, mental warfare or ideological warfare is to prevent the realization that there's even such a thing as the parapolitical or the shadow state. Hence, it's a good place to begin our journey into sense-making. Tactic number one, limited hangouts, which is what gave us this name of our site. Um, Seek, you wanna tell us about limited hangouts? Yeah, to see a term that comes out of the CIA, but what it is basically is, um, in course with our site, it was a little bit of a joke because we were going under pseudonyms, but the, um, you know, something is going to come out or something does come out, uh, something uh, that's some criminality, something that's in the parapolitical. And so you, what you do is just take a, a tiny piece of it. You throw a bone out and you say and you expose some something, maybe you throw someone under the bus. But it really 
you try to hide 80% of it. So it's uh, you know, putting one aspect out there to try to keep the rest hidden. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and you're right. That's also the, the piece about it's kind of clear to the various agencies that they're not gonna be able to keep the story out. So they sort of pre-leak and spin it. And they may also throw in their own deception amidst partial truths and then hide the rest. So the hangout is limited. And our example is a guy by the name of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, you want to talk a little bit more about the Epstein yeah. hangout, Zeke? Yeah, I mean, a lot of when, when it finally did make the, the news, a lot of what we got was, you know, there was some un, underage girls, maybe some teenage girls. It was focused around Prince Andrew, uh, you know, Randy, Andy, getting it on with some teenage girls. But, you know, there's a lot more to the story. I mean, even in terms of who, who was there in terms of sex, sex trafficking, um, the depositions of these teenage girls, they, they say there was a lot younger. There was kids there. Uh, the Virgin Islands has sued the Epstein estate talking about 12 year olds. So we know there's a lot, could be a lot younger than just sort of what's been, been put out in the news. But more than that, I mean, who, who's running the operation? Um, you know, is this Mossad? Is this CIA? Is this, what is it? Um, you know, when, when Acosta, Jim, I think it's Jim Acosta gave his sweetheart deal in 2007 to, to Epstein. And he, he said just a couple of years ago that he was told at the time that he was an asset. So for who, for what? You know, and these depositions, again, from, from the women who were involved, um, talk about all his, all his houses, all his mansions having been completely wired for video. So again, who's doing, you know, who's being video? What's the, the, the blackmail operation going on? And also he's, he's cozied up to a lot of scientists, a lot of, you know, there's just, uh, there's a lot of layers under that we, you know, the, the news does not want, want to touch at all. Again, we get, we get a focus on kind of uh you know prince andrew and and, and some teenage girls mm -hmm. and we got there peter dale scott previously mentioned as part of um the deep state or deep politics parapolitics he talks about deep events and these are ones where the parapolitical for a moment the underground or shadow state pops into public awareness and it's sort of an out of character, obviously Epstein's death slash, if you want to say murder, um, was in a sense a deep event. It pops in, pops up out of seemingly out of nowhere, though, if you're following various parapolitical threads, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but it seems to in the normal course of political discourse. And then immediately, usually a limited hangout is there to try to contain the spread. And as Zeke is saying there, there's all kinds of threads running off Epstein that have not really been fully explored. So that's a very likely limited hangout as an example. Some other possible, these are a little bit more speculative. Um, Zeke likes to talk about probabilities and discernment in this work, which is part of sense making. And I really appreciate that. So I'll always say like, is this like 70% or 30% or what kind of percentage probabilities would we give to a various kind of interpretation? So Watergate, I think that's probably like 80 or 90% of a limited hangout probability in the sense of our public narrative and the, all the president's men and Woodward and Bernstein and paranoid Nixon. We have our kind of public conception of Watergate, but there's a lot of the aspects of the Watergate story that don't make any sense. Number one, like why even the burglary happened. <laughs> the cover-up makes sense. The burglary and the intent of the original crime really doesn't, I would say, in sort of mainstream discourse. So is that a potential room for a limited hangout? The assassination attempt on President Reagan by John Hinckley Jr. There's a lot of weirdness about that story. And also potentially the re recent UFO disclosures by various militaries admitting the existence of UFOs, whatever that means. And I've made some arguments in those pieces that I think that's part of a larger limited hangout and hop, or at least potentially so. So that's our first. Yeah, go ahead, Zeke. No, just gonna add on the UFO one. I mean, anybody that's done really some research into the ufology knows that there's so much more to the possibility of, uh, you know, what's going on in that realm. And, and all we get is a Tic Tac video, you know what I mean? So right. it, it feels, yeah, very limited hangout. -y. Yeah. So that's our first 
tactic of worldview warfare limited or sometimes called partial hangouts. Number two, uh, problem reaction solution. This is one you'll hear or see quite a bit. Parapolitical or other shadowy forces create a problem, engineer a media reaction leading to a public outcry for a solution that supports typically deeper tyranny or militarization of society. So you create the problem, you offer the solution to the problem that you've already created, and it creates a kind of closed loop. Our example is the research of Gary Webb, known as the Dark Alliance. And what Gary Webb did in the 80s was he tracked the flow of the illegal weapon sales to Iran as part of Iran-Contra. And those weapon sales were then used to fund uh, right-wing paramilitary death squads in Central America, known as the Contras. That was the Contra part of Iran-Contra. Those paramilitary death squad kind of groups then started to control the drug trade and were connected to intelligence assets in the US, CIA particularly, who then used the drugs to intentionally flood them into black neighborhoods in the US, leading to the crack epidemic. The crack epidemic, of course, leads to violence, chaos, crime, etc leading to a call in the wider American society for a massive militarization of police. And that gives us the for-profit prison industrial complex. And even going back before Iran-Contra, back to Nixon, an aide to Nixon recently admitted publicly that the war on drugs, which Nixon was the one who famously came up with that framing, they always knew it was a cover story to militarize the the police and crack down on poor and minority and left-wing communities in the US. And they just admit it. And so back then, people who argued that, and there were some who said, look, they're going to use the war on drugs as the justification and the cover for militarizing the police, were of course all described as, you know, tinfoil hat nutters. Gary Webb, uh, sad to say, died under extremely mysterious circumstances. We might not be super surprised to hear that, but that did happen but his work stands, I think, the test of time. Well, now we have, it's admitted at this point, we have movies with Tom Cruise about the subject, right? So. Yeah, that the CIA had its own airline um, and was using it as a, a front for drug, drug movement. So there's problem reaction solution tactic number two. Behind door number three, piggybacking or co-opting. Piggybacking is another Peter Dale Scott term. And it's the exploitation of a real legitimate social issue to a destructive end, often by co-opting an existing social reform movement's language as moral justification or cover for tyrannical ends. Um, examples that we're throwing out as possibilities of piggybacking or co-opting operations would be how uh, the major push right now for universal basic income. So uh, when it started out, of course, it was seen as a kind of loony left-wing idea. But now you got like Zuckerberg and you know Bill Gates and all these kind of tech overlords <laughs> want everybody to have UBI. And they pitch it as in the news, like they become humanitarian capitalists or philanthropic capitalists or something. But if a UBI were to be tied to a social credit scheme, which is something we explore in that piece that's linked there, then a UBI could be weaponized very easily. So it's not that the idea of a UBI is inherently problematic. I actually think it's a good idea, generally speaking. But if it's got so many strings attached that are dependent on digital identification or technocratic ends, then a UBI becomes kind of a Trojan horse to another end. Anything you want to say on that, Zeke? Yeah, I was just thinking of um, so your, your example down there of the sovereign digital currencies. Um, you know, the, the German fellow, I can't remember his name, high up in, you know, uh, but he was talking about these new maybe nation state centralized cryptocurrencies. Well, one of the things, you know, it'd be great because then we would know we would know uh, who, who did every transaction. So this would be a, a great way to fight crime, right? 
and no more black market, you know, a lot less we can, you know, but it's also a way that we can all be tracked <laughs> or the way that, you know, it, back to the old sharecroppers where you have, you know, you can't buy that because you, 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 you follow this social movement or whatever. So I also want to say too, back to your point about co-opting existing, so, existing social reform movements is that it's often, it's, it's piggybacking on, um, it's enticing us in with the better angels of our nature with, with the world that, you know, the more beautiful world we know, our hearts know is possible, you know, so it's going, it's pulling us, uh, you know, um, in our, in our deepest uh, good values, I think, and we get sort of the bait and switch, you know, and I think a little bit later, we're going to talk about it, but I'll mention it here because we want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, you know, uh, evil or taking evil seriously again when you start looking at some of this work or at least taking uh psychopathy or, or psychopaths or, uh you know that kind of uh, awareness uh, you know and how that they, they can rise in in a system like that because it seems so yeah evil or, or you know really brutal but you know that's that's the world we live in you know we also mentioned there environmentalism that a lot of the language of environmentalism has also been co-opted in numerous cases to, um, and sustainability language, which again, who can be against environmental sustainability when you hear it as a kind of slogan, it all sounds great and wonderful. But then when we look into the details and it starts looking like surveillance or it starts looking like technocratic ends or um, yeah, taking people off the land to save the earth, then it starts to look less humanitarian and progressive, so. Piggybacking, co-opting, our third tactic to watch out for. And number four, good old famous controlled opposition and the controlled dialectic. And Zeke, I think you're going to tell us about this one. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I'll give you a couple examples, but this is where you, you sort of create, you infiltrate or create uh, your own opposition, anti-government anti uh, opposition. Um, so you know, a couple examples would be maybe you um, install a, a voice on Patriot Radio and, and this guy's a great patriot, he's going to fight against deep state, blah, 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 but really he, he's been put in there and he acts as a gatekeeper, uh, maybe steers the movement in directions that are, are kind of useless or down past the, so that, that might be an example. Another one, so Cass Sunstein, the um, legal scholar, he was part of the um, Obama administration, he openly wrote about that government agencies should conduct covert operations using uh, pseudo independent agents of in, in influence to, to cognitively infiltrate these extremist groups. So he was openly saying this is what we should do. We should get into, um, you know, uh, movements and, and steer them in, and steer them. Of course, this was done in, in COINTELPRO. Um, and, and it's often the case that you're taking a group and you're making them more violent. Um, yeah, or a little bit more, yeah, just look a little, look a bit more loony. Um, so those are some of the, the tactics uh, there. Um, do you have any other? Yeah, we were going to do the, yeah. the the strategy of tension would be another great example. So in the um, 50s and 60s, when the um, French-Algerian War, which was quite brutal, was going on, there were a number of uh, French counterinsurgency theorists who argued for infiltrating and radicalizing opposition. So a lot of them were sort of from right-wing fascist, quasi-fascist kind of dynamics. They infiltrated and agitated leftist guerrilla movements in order to cause greater chaos in the streets. This was the whole theory, the strategy of tension. And then they thought the public would call for a third way, a seemingly benevolent neutral force that would come to quell the violence in the streets between these various kind of paramilitary groups and that third way would be a military dictatorship which is what they wanted so there's um, potentially examples from what's known as operation gladio groups that were if you read the official narrative like the batter mine the batter meinhof gang or the brigadi which are usually treated as kind of left-wing guerrilla groups in the 70s in europe who did train bombings and assassinations and kidnappings and things like that there's high suspicion and speculation that those were actually potentially infiltrated groups. And 
those French counterinsurgency theorists, by the way, became um, some of the guiding lights for the US NATO counterinsurgency doctrine in Afghanistan and Iraq, H.R. McMaster, David Petraeus, uh, characters like that. And then those forces, you know, it kind of all goes full circle. Those forces influence the development of militarized police tactics that we've seen over the last decade or two. And we know how well that all worked out given the recent events in Afghanistan. So that's an example of controlled opposition, potentially. And another, I'll just give a, uh, another recent example is the uh, uh, kidnapping case of uh, the attempt to kidnap uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. And it was revealed that 12 of the 14 guys were uh, FBI informants. So um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But, you know, there's a, yeah, as we see on the screen here, a couple of good examples of books um, that have come out uh, recently, Revolutions End by, by Schrieber. He makes a pretty solid case. This is a 2019, I think, that uh, somebody, Symbionese Liberation Army was created by the CIA. Um, and he's got lots of receipts to show that at this point with declassified documents. And, and uh, it was done for several reasons. One was to actually um, to make the radical left look bad. Um, uh, that was a, a part of it. Part of it was they did some, the SLA did some killings that were quite targeted if you look at who they, who they were. Um, so anyway, that's a, a good book. You can listen to some interviews with Schrieber and, um, um, you know, Charles Manson and, and the family, uh, Tom O'Neill's book also, 20 Years in the Making that just came out. Um, you know, it makes a, a very, very strong case again with lots of documentation that, uh, Charles Manson and the family might have been a vehicle also of, of the CIA. Tactic behind door number five, we have false flag attacks. And I think you're also going to do this one, Zeke. Yeah, and I, I think what I want to say on this one is what I was just kind of mentioning a couple minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Well, two, two things. First of all, the word false flag, I just want to note that it is a contested term in our culture right now. You know, you know, any event happens and there's some dude on the internet, false flag, false flag, right? So it's a pretty, it's, it's gotten in the middle of the culture war, right? So just want to name that. And also, I think when you think about this tactic, I think, I argue at several points on the site that I think modernity um, and the modern mind, uh, it was a mistake to get to not no longer believe in the evil and the reality of evil. And I think we have to reintegrate that, you know, integral away um, to really believe that people would do this, kill their own citizens, for instance. Um, and, and if we don't, if we want to go as far as evil, then I think, you know, we at least have to think about real politic. There's, 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 there's people playing games on a scale that they just don't care about some broken bodies. So I think, you know, to, to take this one in, you know, I think that's an important context, but yeah. So you intentionally, um, you know, it's, you attack, uh, you attack your own citizens or your allies, you blame it on your enemy. Uh, and then, you know, it allows you often to go to war with, with someone and it can com combine with, with, with patsies, the use of the patsies. Mm -hmm. And some possible examples historically, um, the Swedish-Russian War of 1788, that's uh, everybody's favorite. That, that one is a well-historically documented example where the king had them dress up in, uh, Swedish troops dress up as Russian soldiers, soldiers, excuse me, and attack their own outpost and use that as a cause of war justification. The um, Operation Northwoods was something proposed to JFK, but which he uh, kiboshed at least officially, and that was a CIA plan, proposed plan to have agents dress up like Cubans and uh, commit terrorist attacks inside the US against civilians in order to promote an anti-Castro or Cuban war. This was after Bay of Pigs failure. Um, Gulf of Tonkin, also a very shadowy event and was used as a justification for the escalation of the war in Vietnam, which weirdly involves Jim Morrison's dad, who was an admiral for the US Navy. And there's a whole backstory for those interested in um, that. That's Dave McGowan's book, Weird Scenes in the Canyon, which explores the very weird intersection between the 60s counterculture 
and the California scene and military intelligence. Cool. And the sinking of the USS Maine, which may have been a false flag, may have been actually attacked by Spanish forces. It was an American ship or may have actually just blown up due to a fire on board the ship. But there was an actual sinking and it was used as the justification for um, the Spanish-American War. Oh, and the Mukden incident is a um, bombing of a train that most people now would consider to be pretty obviously set by um, Japanese military as a justification for the invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing our time here, we should probably. Yeah. yeah it's okay. Moving. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. You're going to do this one, weaponizing yeah. social scientific research. Yeah, I'll try to keep it as sort of short yeah. as possible. But um, as we get into the 20th century, so we said at the beginning, um, this is sort of the, the more the scientific, from worldview warfare, propaganda to worldview, worldview, worldview warfare, easy for me to say, um, really starts to happen in the 20th century. And, and you know, it begins with psychology and depth psychology itself, you know, starting to understand the human mind in a, in a deeper way. Um, and as many people probably might know by this point, Edward, Edward Bernays, who was the nephew of Freud, um, used uh, some of Freud's theories and understandings of the unconscious to uh, develop the public relations industry and propaganda and sort of advertising as we know it. And, you know, he, he, you know, he uh, helped Americans eat bacon for breakfast and you can go learn about him. It's, but, you know, so it's already in the, you know, in the twenties and thirties, um, the sort of weaponizing of social science is happening. Uh, another example is, is the anthropologist uh, Gregory Bateson. He, in the, in the twenties and thirties, he's studying, in the field about how schisms and, uh, happen uh, between different um, tribes. And he's learning what, 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 what generates these divisions and he calls it schismogenesis. Well, this, this understanding was used by the Office of Strategic Services, uh, that's the precursor to the CIA, against Japanese territories in, in World War II. So it's already um, <clears throat> happening then, but it's really in World War II where we get the Japanese and the Russians and the Germans starting to uh, experiment on humans and you know legal experiments on on human beings, and um, and we know, oh, most of us know about the German experiments. Well, a lot of those Germans were brought uh, to um, to the U.S. and actually many many countries um, uh, through Project, Project Paperclip. And these these uh, these studies on humans, these illegal studies, uh, continued in MK Ultra, uh, various programs of MK Ultra. Um, yeah, so I'm just looking at the, the one on the screen here. So this gets used in various ways. This this understanding of, of is brought about through MK Ultra gets used in a in a variety of, of ways, but. Um, it's come out more and more in some, some writings in the last five years that it was used. Uh, Naomi Klein saw, she kind of made a, um, a comparison in her, her book, uh, uh, Shock Doctrine, between the, the research that was being done in the MK Ultra and the Shock Doctrine. But we know now that, that, that the, the, the Pinochet regime, regime really did use techniques understood through MK Ultra on the people, especially right at the very beginning when he brought everybody into the stadium and they had this caravan of death that traveled around the country and, and did brutal things in front of villages. And so some of what was learned in MK Ultra was used on in, in situations like that. It also came to be the, uh, the basis of the Kubark manual, that's the CIA interrogation manual. Um, so how to break people basically and, and get information out of them. And that is, was taught to many of the dictatorships of, uh, of, of South America, leaving a uh, a terror trail for for 20 years. Um, we in this images we saw of, saw out of Abu Ghraib in Iraq. They were using these these same techniques: humiliation, uh, uh, well, torture, obviously, but the sleep deprivation, all this different kind of stuff. Fear your deepest fears and whatnot. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, Corey, you want to add add to that at all? Yeah, just um, we got some uh, titles there on this slide, and just to say again, these are. PhDs, this are, these are doctoral 
these are doctors, these are not, you know, rants on a self-published Kindle or whatever. And I just point your attention, especially to the one on the bottom, Surveillance Valley by Yasha Levine, which really explores very deeply um, the militarized and military intelligence context for the development of Silicon Valley. So when we start to think about, oh my God, how did the internet and all this, you know, shadow banning and, you know, deplatforming and censorship and wasn't the internet all supposed to be free and libertarian and the cyberpunks? Well, maybe some of the surveillance apparatus was actually built in from the beginning or was part of the genesis. And he makes a very good case for that in that book. So, and there we can have a we'll have an MK Ultra moment <laughs> all together, um, leading us to tactic number seven: the weaponization of the paranormal, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, this, like a lot of this stuff, even in like MK Ultra, I just mentioned, is a template that starts with the Nazis, particularly the SS, followed later by the Soviets and the Western powers during the Cold War and beyond. Um, Project Stargate, for those who don't know of that, there's a great documentary called Third Eye Spies that just came out about it. It was a CIA study in the development of whether they could develop a specific uh, protocol for remote viewing and whether they could use remote viewing um, capacities for psychic espionage. So Third Eye Spies. Um, and as crazy as that sounds, if you think that's crazy that the CIA was paying guys to go around and astral travel and see if they could find uh, hidden bases, turns out they could actually do it. That was the craziest part. It was actually super successful. And they were freaked out by it, too. And they were like, holy <laughs> man, because that means their enemy could do it, too. Which uh, gets to a really interesting thread that we cover a lot on the site, which is officially we live in this kind of scientific, materialistic secular culture, but when we keep studying the oddity of intelligence agencies knowing full well that psychic phenomena and the paranormal are real and how they might weaponize it, which is a fascinating subject. Um, also, along these lines, we can sometimes see the incorporation of dark occult symbolism in the shadow state or parapolitical activities. Uh, Dave McGowan, previously mentioned with um, Weird Scenes in the Canyon, wrote another book called Program to Kill, which is a dark but important read that explores the possibility of the serial killer phenomenon being deeply tied to um, Black military operations out of Vietnam, actually. So and I'll just say a couple words on that, because these, mm. these two books are, are dark books, but they're important. You know, they really show the depth of... Uh, yeah, the depravity or the absolute disregard for, for human life. But um, in, in Dave McGowan's book, he quotes, there was a, uh, there was a U U.S. Navy psychologist, I, can't, I think it was in about the late 70s, but he was speaking to um, United Nations, a gathering of United Nations psychologists uh, from, sorry, from NATO psychologists rather. And he kind of spilled the beans and he shouldn't have. And he was marched out later to try to take it back, but it was kind of out there. But he said at this conference that, um, the Office of Naval Intelligence had taken convicted murderers from military prisons and used behavior modification techniques, i.e. MKUltra, and then relocated them through the world, throughout the world, and that he, he revealed how the Navy was secretly programming large number of these guys to be large number of assassins. And he said that they had been carefully screened, um, screening of the subjects was accomplished by Navy psychologists through the military records, and many were convicted murderers serving military prison sentences. So these same folks were the ones who, these same kind of people were the ones who were sent in uh, to do the Phoenix program in Vietnam, and it was terrorize, terrorize people uh, and uh, anybody suspected of being Viet, uh, sympathetic to Viet Cong. And so these guys who like to murder and kill were made even worse and sent on rampages around, uh, you know, South Vietnam. So stark material, but you can see at the level, you know, at least some folks are playing. And our last tactic is junk conspiracy and disinformation campaigns. Amplifying the most bizarro pseudo conspiracies in order to smear everyone associated with the critique of mainstream narrative of the tinfoil hat and nutter, like our earlier picture. And I think 
Zeke, you wanted to talk about <laughs> sure. some examples. You want to go to the ne next slide too? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Um, you know, uh, we might get some hate mail for this, but uh, you know, we would consider, because there's some passionate flat earthers out there, but um, uh, flat earth to be uh, uh, either a, a full on intelligent agency operation or at least uh, guided and, 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 and furthered by it. But it, you'll notice in, in the media how often something that could be a legitimate um, you know, criminal activity or conspiracy is is put into uh, the next in the same sentence. The next one is flat earth or you believe this and then flat earth. So the most, you know, it gets associated with the most kind of preposterous thing. And and uh, so that that's one of them. I think another really important one is the book and the movie Mirage Men, where naval intelligence admits, um, you know, through this agent Richard Doty, that they were feeding the ufology community with all kinds of silly stories, dead ends, um, just to make them look uh, goofy. And, and the British intelligence also had a whole department that their, uh, their role was just to ridicule and make fun of ufology so that it was you know, not considered, uh, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't study it if you didn't wanna look like an, an idiot. They wouldn't even talk about it. So those are two um, big examples. Um, I will say there's a, there's a kind of a way that a uh, pattern that junk conspiracy takes. So often there's an incident, let's say the JFK assassination, um, there's an official report. So the Warren Commission, but then after that, there's a, there, there builds a, a credible body of alternative knowledge. And this might be built by professors, journalists, detectives, and they begin to put something together that really questions that official narrative. And that's the time where you see junk conspiracy get flooded into it. You know, it's Jackie that killed JFK or what, whatever it is, right? So, so that seems to be a very consistent pattern. And it makes sense making in the parapolitical very difficult because the space is quite flooded with this kind of thing. Yes. Yes. That's we, right. Yeah. So there's our junk conspiracy with guy. The eyes. <laughs> um, yeah, there's junk conspiracy. Yeah, exactly. And just uh, quickly, some concluding remarks. Um, that sense making is orientation. And as we've seen, particularly through the MK Ultra and MK Ultra like threads, trauma is disorientation. So worldview warfare are tactics that are used fundamentally in one way or another to create traumatic disorientation. So the sense making the parapolitical we're arguing is the ability to stay regulated and grounded as one comes to understand or discern as best we can the influence of deeper states or shadow states historically and presently. And for anybody interested, there's a more official definition from Peter Dale Scott. But that really concludes yeah. our presentation and we're happy to field questions. And Peter, do I need to exit the, I mean, exit the screen share or you can do that? Yeah, yeah. I'll just turn it uh, off. Um, Awesome. Uh, well, well done, gents. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat if anyone has a question that they would like to ask, and I'll call on you and you're going to mute yourself. So uh, in the meantime, I'll warm up uh, you guys with some questions. So when I was uh, uh, um, thinking about sense making the political with my good friend uh, Lubomir, who did the in shadow um, kind of animation, uh, like the three failure modes that came up was uh, one, you go crazy or like hyper paranoid. Uh, two, you get dismissed or canceled. And then three, <laughs> you get suicide in, in the most uh, or suicide in the most extreme uh, case. So those two, let's just say those three, perhaps more uh, um, failure modes of, of the sense being the parapolitical, how do you two deal with them? And uh, how do you recommend um, they can be mitigated? Mm. It's a great question. You want to go that? First? Sure, yeah. sure. I, I think, yeah, like as we uh, talking about staying, staying grounded, using a lot of discernment, um, trying to learn these lessons, these things we've talked about today will, will help, you know, not going, you know, getting pulled way out, you know, um, uh, you know, into the ether. Um, sorry, I, just, just thinking about yeah in terms of uh, you know not not getting suicided I think there really was a time that it'd be quite dangerous to speak about these, these material and and um, there was a, a great article in Paranoia magazine that was talking about all the ufology researchers who have been either murdered or, or died uh, odd 
odd deaths. Um, but I, I think at this point, so many more people are awake to this material that, you know, it, it's not feasible to snuff out um, those voices. The other thing I would say is just as, as Korg mentioned, we do try to hold both a, you know, ontological flooding so that, uh, you know, being very open-minded, but also very uh, critical and skeptical and try to use our rational. And, and also he, he talked about using that percentages. So I really kind of try to hold a whole pile of things that just maybe that 70%, I believe that might be true. And then you get new data and okay, that's down or like a giant equalizer on a stereo, you know? So I think holding not too tight to it, moving with new data, that'd be my answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. And also, um, one of the things, a number of pieces that I've written on the site are because we mentioned the trauma angle, which is direct, obviously, from the MK Ultra aspect, um, was actually learning things like somatic practices for traumatic regulation, like how to actually regulate our own emotional and nervous systems, especially if we're going down various sort of research dynamics. Um, I also just kind of, I always like this line from C.S. Lewis, kind of from a more, like this mm -hmm. theological perspective that I like to quote, which is, he said, there are two mistakes when it comes to evil, because Zeke was talking about evil. The first mistake is to underestimate it. And the second mistake is to overestimate it. And so when we're working with this stuff, I think it's important to understand this is not, nobody's saying this is the whole story, but that we can't bypass this dimension because it's been occluded and um, it's actually critical to the present moment. And the present moment is obviously all kinds of wacky and weird in all kinds of ways, but it's actually surprisingly less so if you've spent some time, at least I would say, with some of this material. Yeah. And um... So another question I had is, uh, like I, I kind of I gave up talking to a lot of people about kind of parapolitical machinations. And I think I come from a pretty sensible and, and pretty skeptical place as well. But if you, you broach some of these topics, people's minds just shut down, like they don't want to go there. They might pattern match you as some tinfoil hat wearing person or whatever. Um, even as very sensible stuff like the Epstein situation and some of the um, stuff that's already out there on it. Um, and I'm curious why you think that is, um, I, I speculate that perhaps it's just, if one thing is, is true, um, like any of the things that you mentioned in this presentation, it could just could be, could lead to other things being true. And then it just becomes too terrifying because everything you thought you believed to be true turned out to be a lie or, or uh, some form of a misinformation or propaganda. So I'm curious what your sense is that overall allergy to a lot of this stuff is to, to certain people. Yeah, I think you make a great point. Um, the piece that I uh, linked to at the beginning, the conspiratorial grief piece, is basically a piece that looks at Kubler-Ross's stages of dying, stages of grief, and explores it as a model for encountering this work, because I do think it is fundamentally to really accept it and go through it. It really is, in a sense, a kind of metaphorical death and rebirth process, and one really does is changed. That is the rabbit hole. I mean, Alice does come out eventually the other side of Wonderland and she has changed by her initiatory journey. And that process is often isolating for people or they're scared. They're going to lose, uh, people can lose their jobs. People lose family members. They lose relationships. Um, so it is important to be able to understand that the yeah, it's a real scenario. It's a real legitimate existential scenario in play. I wouldn't add too much more that I think both of you are on right on the right or the, the track that I, I would agree with. I, I think there there's something that is, it is scary and there's, 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 there's a, this is dark material. You need, you need to take it, take it one step at a time. I mean, I remember when I, I sort of got into all this going by looking at Jimmy Savile and, and, and then you get into, um, you know, all that that kind of world and it, it was dark it, it stained my soul for months almost you know I could feel it there that darkness but once I was able to you know move through that um, I, I don't really feel that as much anymore um, so but I don't know I think it is it, it's scary and it's dark but it only succeeds because it's in darkness so 
if we, you know, more eyes on it, the weaker it gets. You know? Yeah, the the Savo and the pedophocracy type of uh, yeah. rabbit holes is <laughs> it's pretty fucking dark. Yeah. Um, and I guess my last question would be the uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you, you both of you have an integral theory background. Uh, mm -hmm. We're influenced by the work of Ken Wilber and kind of like that developmental theory. Uh, how does that fit into uh, um, all of this, you think, and how did it inform your uh, parapolitical investigations? You want me to take that first? Yeah, go for it. Well, you know what's cool, Peter, I haven't told you yet, is that uh, when, I, when we were in the midst of making, putting this project together, um, I read your, um, your piece on mimetic tribes. And uh, in it, in, your, in, in, the, in the integral section, you said, these people could be interesting if they got political. And I just took that as a, uh, you know, a, a, a synchronicity from the universe, you know, but I think for myself, in terms of the broader um, investigation of the site in terms into the, also the paranormal, I always felt in the integral world, it was, you know, there was this, this phrase of transcend and, in, and include, but there was almost no including <laughs> so of uh shamanism or the purple meme and that you know the lower levels the early stages of our consciousness see no one really wanted to integrate uh you know magic animism those, those things and so i just got disillusioned there and said let's let's do something our, our, ourselves um you know and i was largely disillusioned by sort of the main mainstream integral scene although many of those people are still my friends and, and whatnot and um um, but there's a real block in, in the center of that towards the parapolitical, like fiercely, like, I don't know what it would take, you know, um, you know, Blofeld himself coming out from behind a, a, you know, a thing saying, you're right, we do run this whole thing. I don't know, because, you know, there's a huge resistance. So just kind of had to move on, but I still use parts of the map. I think it's very helpful. Yeah. And I think, um, we talked about, you know, in, in integral sort of language, we talked quite a bit about states, particularly MK Ultra, MK Often, or similar type artichoke, bluebird, etc. You know, they are dealing with altered states of consciousness, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. The whole use of LSD weaponization on experimenting on people in MK Ultra. For example, so we ought to know about states, if nothing else, because states of consciousness are central to the whole aspect of worldview warfare. So I actually think there's a lot of room, and I've tried, you know, within various pieces to kind of incorporate that, particularly that dimension of that philosophical framework that I think can be really helpful for defense of our souls, essentially. Yeah. All right. So I have a bunch of questions, but I think it'd be good to pivot. Um, to some uh, other voices. Uh, Brian, uh, you had uh, two questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And first, thanks. This was excellent. Hard to keep up taking all my notes. Um, but uh, yeah, the question number one, and I think you start. One of you started to answer this about uh, how did you get started on this, and I heard Jimmy Savile. Um, but I, mm -hmm. you want to expand upon that. And the second one is, you know, this is such a huge field. I've been kind of digging into it for 25 years now. And how do you guys determine which rabbit holes to fall down? I mean, you recommended so many great books here and I'm mm -hmm. like writing them all down and going, oh, I want to read that, I want to read that, but how do I determine which one to read first? And then the last kind of question is, I'm curious how one enters into this field as a researcher, reporter, writer, because I am kind of considering doing that, but um, yeah, it's just hard to know where to start. So, and thanks for, thanks for this, this was great. Oh, thanks, Brian. Really glad to you appreciate it. Thanks for being here and your question. Um, in terms of the second question, um, I would say, you know, you just kind of everybody has to find their if you're going to go down this one, you, it seems to me anyway, uh, from my own experience and those that I know in this world, like some one story or one nexus of stories really seems to have some kind of personal pull. Um, for myself, it was actually my entryway was research about the continuation of what's called the post-war Nazi or fascist international and its penetration into the West, particularly like paperclip and then the influence of MK Ultra. So that for me was kind of the doorway just for whatever reason. Um, 
Um, and then that kind of connected into all these other dimensions. For some people, you know, uh, Zeke mentioned earlier, like the whole assassinations sub part of this. So the JFK or RFK or MLK, um, you know, if one gets like, if that's one story that can help in terms of Peter's earlier question, like what can help sometimes move through when there's a lot of cognitive dissonance or emotional dissonance, some kind of one story seems to be whatever it might be in that case, JFK. That might be, if you feel drawn, I would say go down a rabbit hole, go down one that feels drawn to you and, and follow that and follow those threads, I would say. Do you have any other thoughts, Zeke? Yeah, yeah, I would, on the question of how I got in, yes, for me, it was the, the pedophilia and the child trafficking and, um, you know, going from Savile, you get to the Franklin scandal and then the Dutro affair. And then, it, I mean, the Dutro affair, if you just listen to what he was doing to these girls, it's just absolutely disgusting. I mean, I think, I hope for the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible. And I know that's going on. I just can't look away from it, you know? So that just, in any, that was my entry in, um, in terms of how do I wade through all the material? I think for myself and I think Korg as well, we try to find researchers that we think are, you know, they use um, rationality, skepticism, data, you know, or, or um, uh, citations, you know? So guys like Joseph Farrell, I like Jay Dyer, Jay's analysis. Uh, uh, Richard Dolan in the ufology space. So these are guys that if it's documented, they won't speculate really if unless they've seen documentation. So trying to work with at first, you know, those kind of tier researchers um, and stay grounded to the to the as many facts as, as possible and really name when you're speculating if you are. Um, in terms of your last question, getting something started, I would say just do it. It's amazing space, the alternative media is if you look at the numbers around Rumble, BitChute, other places, uh, Substack, it's, you know, it's, that's where the people are. Uh, a lot of millions of people are, are getting their information for, from there. So if you've been studying this for a long time, I would just say, get a Substack or whatever it is and just go for it. Any uh, follow-up shares or questions, Brian? Oh, just thanks. That all that all resonates and it all makes a lot of sense. So appreciate what you guys have done and really love this presentation. So thanks a lot. Cool. Uh, Todd, you had a question. Yeah, um, I, I appreciated your presentation as well. And I guess, um, you know, in the last answer, you gave some examples of, you know, kind of definitely some dark side trends in sort of personalities and people who have been involved in the whole notion and connection of evil and the psychopaths. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, listening to what you guys say, I think there's certainly, I don't know, I guess I might call them enablers, but other people involved who might be on kind of, a, a, for a time, a more normal path. And I'm kind of curious if you, in your readings in these areas, mm -hmm if you found any commonalities of how those people get attracted into these sort of uh, parapolitical actions of various types? Is it, are they pulled in through education? Uh, you know, are they trained in particular places? Is there any commonalities that you found that might be um, sort of, like I say, kind of how people get drawn into these spaces? or thoughts? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, in the slide that we talked about the various kind of nexes, uh, nexus scenarios of like big pharma, big tech, um, the aeronautics industry, there's a whole lot of work that's done that is what I would consider to be compartmentalized. So it's not necessary if we're talking more of the institutional side of these of the, the apparatus. There's definitely a lot of people who are participating in things that they don't realize they're participating in. That would be one act, one just one, just as a job. Um, two, I'd say you have large aspects of control files and blackmail. It's just part of it. So people who just personally, you know, like a whole you know, aspect of the story that can go on underneath, like famous example would be the long speculation, for example, that um, J. Edgar Hoover was closeted and that the mafia had dirt on him. And that's why he was soft on the mafia while he was going after 
Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and tapping their phones and infiltrating that. So that's a whole other side, which is maybe sometimes you'll just get some involved or have family members involved in some regular old kind of stuff that people get involved in and then that's used against. And then there are places where there is People are unwitting assets, like right? part of the whole espionage culture or deception culture here that goes on is, again, back to MK Ultra or similar type things. They spent 30, 40 years figuring out how to hijack people's neurological processes. So that stuff gets used on people. Um, it's, not, it's not pleasant to talk about but it does happen and then people find themselves wrapped in a web that feels problematic. So that would be like people who are actually like more directly influenced. But unfortunately, when we get into things like the black economy and the parasitic economy that's kind of eating from the above ground economy that we all participate in, unfortunately, it's really gnarly to have to admit that like things like pensions and the housing industry and all kinds of stuff have been infiltrated and all of us are to one degree or another, a few degrees of separation, participating in aspects or at least tangentially, tangentially butting up against the institutional aspects, particularly through finance of what's going on here. So that's just part of it, unfortunately. Yeah, I'd add a, a couple things. I mean, mm. uh, classically you get um, recruiting, uh, certain schools or universities are recruiting universities. So you might have, um, you know, Yale and your Georgetown, some of their famous universities where guys get tapped and, you know, uh, I believe, um, oh, what's the Matt Damon, Robert De Niro movie about the CIA. That's, that's what happens to him. Right. So, um, right. there's a bit of that. There's a lot of family members. You would, it's that book that, uh, Korg mentioned weird scenes inside the canyon. You wouldn't believe how many of those uh, rock stars of the 60s were had parents that were intelligence agents uh, uh, or in the intelligence apparatus. It's just, it's a little bizarre, but often family members, kids are a part of it. Um, if you see that in Hollywood, uh, Laura Dern, I can't remember who her dad is, but if you look at that up, he's a big star. So these things all, uh, you know, are get connected. But, um, and then the other thing I would say, yes, it is the blackmail files. It is you bring someone in who has a proclivity and you say, hey, you know, you're controlled, but we'll give you your proclivity. And that's the sad truth of what, you know, that's especially in, 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 the, in politics and the political realm. That's my answer there, yeah. yeah. Thanks for your question. Any uh, follow-up uh, chair question, Todd? No, but thank you for that answer. That was, gave a lot of food for thought. Appreciate it. All right. so. Um, there's a few questions. Uh, maybe we'll have one or two more uh, that uh, people want me to read. So here's a question. When assessing the probability that worldview warfare is involved in any given event, how high does your confidence have to be for you to live your life and make decisions as if this were true? Wow. That's a great question. <laughs> hmm. I don't know that I could put an exact number on it. Um, and some of it is without trying to justify bias, there is a sense in which I guess I could say like spending enough time with this kind of work, there's a certain smell test for lack of a better heuristic that I know could be biased or like just things, I don't know, the gut sense gets honed or developed in a certain way, which is not to say we can't all be mistaken and that's why having probabilities is important but I I mean I have to live my life trying to promote goodness regardless in some ways of whether I think any specific event is part of this larger narrative or not but generally speaking I like just personally a higher degree of um, a sense of probability but you know you kind of have to find your own balance with that um, I would just add, and I hope I'm answering the question, but for, for myself at this point, there's enough data points on the board, like there's enough facts in this area that I, you know, such as the, uh, the CIA drug trafficking into American uh, cities, uh, there's just enough facts on the board that, that I, I, I just live as though it is true, um, mm -hmm. or assume, assume it is, but, uh, but as Korg says, I'm not blackpilled at all, not, but the opposite, I mean, I, 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 uh, 
I think the, the, the growing exposure of, of this realm is, is, is a powerful and a potentially very powerful thing. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, you know, keep fighting that good fight, but. Cool. Um, John, uh, you had a question. So I don't know if this has been addressed already, but um, my question was, how can people who want to address X race plus S race get a minimum viable understanding of worldview warfare to navigate around the terrain of the powerful and create more effective solutions? So what are some of the essential readings to get you started for this end? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, some of the texts we cited um, in the um, in our presentation, particularly like I think I mentioned the Yasha Levine's book on the surveillance apparatus um, in the development of Silicon Valley, I think is a particularly important one. Um, Colin Ross's books, which we cited, which are about the exploitation of individuals um, under official psychiatric um, medical experimentation, human rights abuses. Those might be important ways to understand, as Zeke was saying, the reality and to acknowledge that if these kinds of things have happened, I mean, we gave a lot of examples throughout the 20th and into the early 21st century. If this has been going on for some period of time intentionally, what's the probability that it's all of a sudden just stopped in the last five years or that it's not gonna keep being used? I mean, one of the reasons that the tactics we named are so prevalent is because they're very successful, not always on every case, but there is a certain kind of like playbook. And if the playbook is working, if you're running the play and the play is successful, like in football or basketball, you're just gonna keep running the play until the other team can stop you. Like, that's just how it goes, right? So these tactics show up again and again and again because unfortunately they often are successful from the point of view of the operation. Um, yeah, I would add, you know, someone we've mentioned at the beginning and, and throughout, and I really have to go back and listen to Peter's in interview with Peter Dale Scott, but that's a really rich, factual uh, place mm -hmm. um, to go into his work. He's going to talk about everything from 9-11 to JFK, and and so that's a, a big one. Uh, I, I think another one that comes out for me, a book, is Acid Dreams um, by Martin Lee and Bruce Schlein, because right there, the subtitle is The Complete Social History of LSD, the CIA in the 60s, and you're going to get all kinds of pieces in one book there, you know, um, so that's a good jump in, a well-documented, huge amount of footnotes. Um, and another classic book in this whole space is Tragedy and Hope. Um, who was the author of Tragedy and Hope again? Quickly. Yeah. No, no, okay. no one wants to, uh, no one's probably going to read a thousand page uh, book, but uh, you could listen to Jay Dyer's uh, eight part series on it. But there's also a book by a guy named Joseph Plummer's Tragedy and Hope 101. And um, uh, Quigley was a professor um, and he kind of, he said, so it was a historian of the CFR and he kind of spills the beans, <laughs> maybe in a way, but you know, he shouldn't have. But um, uh, that summary book by Joseph Plummer, Tragedy and Hope 101, would be a great way to see the Anglo uh, American establishment, the, the, the banking, the finance, whatnot. Awesome. Uh, any any follow up uh, shares, John? No, but thanks. Lots of good readings. Thank you. Um, all right, David, uh, you had a question. Yeah, I was asking. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, oh, different Davids. Which yeah. David? Yeah, let's go with uh, David Fisher first and then uh, the other David. I just had a quick question about um, the, the church committee, U.S. Senate church committee did a report in the mid 70s, which in theory had addressed a lot of the you know, mm -hmm. dirty deeds of the CIA in the 50s and 60s. And I was wondering if, if, um, if you have thoughts about how if that was effective or 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 uh, did that it compound the problem or what oh thanks for your, yeah thanks for your question um 
There's actually uh, one of the guys uh, we've mentioned, Joseph Farrell, um, has a book on uh, McCarthy, two books on McCarthy. Um, and he talks about it as the era of the committees. So there was, um, there was the church committee on the CIA, the Senate and the House had select commissions on the JFK assassination. There was the Reese Commission, which looked at um, the influence of um, the influence of tax exempt foundations in the US political process, which was super interesting. There was the House on American Activities Committee, which was originally started, everyone remembers it from McCarthy and the Red Scare in the 50s, uh, the anti-communist stuff, but it was originally started to go after war profiteering and folks who were working against the embargo against the Nazis. So there's a whole series of these committees throughout that 50s, 60s period. And some are on the mafia and some are on um, penetration of Soviet espionage into the West, some are on the CIA, some are on fascist penetration. And what Farrell is basically arguing is like none of these committees could see that these were all different tendrils or uh, arms or appendages of the squid. And he actually thinks various committees were concentrating on whether it was organized crime, um, fascism, communism, et cetera. So that to me is a very interesting frame of reference for that whole era, because those aspects of that era are often forgotten. But more directly to your question, MK Ultra, what we know of MK Ultra was because officially the CIA burned all the files, but accidentally somehow forgot to burn like 20% of them. And so they actually went to Congress and said, sorry, we lost all the files. <laughs> it turned out they actually had some, but we know we only got a very small percentage. So to what degree any of those committees have surfaced as some aspects of legitimate operations, for sure that happened. Um, and various people got you know kicked out here and there, but it's not entirely clear that that didn't just drive things underground either necessarily. Zeke, do you have a thought on that question? The only thing I would add, um, I do think it was a, a, a good moment, especially the church committee, but um, a lot of things did come into public consciousness that were really just totally occulted. Uh, I've, I've heard Richard Dolan speak. He's uh, a very good in ufology. And he says that after those committees, it was, I don't think it was the invention of Freedom of Information Acts, maybe, but if not, it was, he said, he called it the golden age for about eight to 10 years after that. Mm -hmm. The, the you know, Freedom of Information Act would get the materials back. And a lot of what the field of ufology knows uh, is from that golden age. After that, the, the, door, the doors got clamped down and it's much harder and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. So there was a sort of an, an opening uh, there, uh, apparently, um, that was positive. Yeah, and both in the ufology as well as the intelligence world, that led to, in part, when the committees got more in their regulation, and oversight, it led to a lot of the outsourcing and privatization. So I don't know, the Snowden case would be a classic example right there, where he's like, how much of what we now call, say, the CIA in the US con context or intelligence agencies are actually public private or private corporations that are in a public contract that are outsourced that are doing intelligence operation work. We see that a lot with the ufology, with the aeronautics industry, as Richard Dolan has pointed out. Those corporate entities are beyond Freedom of Information Act requests because they're no longer governmental. So in part, I think it drove a lot of these activities into private sector, subterranean, off books kind of stuff. But it's a great question, so thank you for it. Any quick follow-up share, David? No, that was, it's interesting that the, uh, the whole, um, that it became privatized and, uh, uh, and, I, and I guess we've been seeing some of that in our storytelling and, and so forth as well. So that's, um, uh, that's an interesting way to look at that. And ho hopefully there's some, will be some, I mean, there's obviously, there are committees happening right now looking at the, mm -hmm the January 6th stuff and, and around that. And hopefully that will 
um, produce some good stuff without also creating an equal or worse problem. Um, did the other David, uh, do you want to have a quick share before we close out? Uh, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that might counter some of the uh, negativity of this whole subject is just the fact that, you know, we're, our empire is failing. I mean, we haven't won a war since World War II. We can't, uh, Boeing can't make planes that stay in the sky. These techniques, they're, they're sleazy, they're scary, they're freakish. But ultimately, I mean, are they really effective at accomplishing anything of use? Mm. Mm. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm just saying that as a way to say maybe it's not so horrible in a sense. I mean, because I mean, when I, I agree with almost everything you guys said, I've, I've studied these things and they do seem to be true. When you talk to people about all this negative stuff we've done in foreign policy over the years, people just they can't even hear it because we're the good guys. Mm -hmm. um, but well, not only are we not the good guys, we're not the winners, <laughs> as though we see we see ourselves as such. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, no, there's a lot of, you know, I think back to your, you know, Korg's quote of C.S. Lewis. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of mistakes, a lot of sloppiness in all this, too. There's a lot of things that fail. Um, and I, I, I'm a believer in, you know, the story, the Tower of Babel tells a real truth about the cosmos. And, and when we too try to, when man tries to become God and rule in that total way, um, it, it eventually topples. And so, you know, I'm hopeful from that perspective as well. Mm. Yeah, I like that you said that. I don't really have anything to add to that. That's nice. All right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I'll sneak in maybe one last question before we close out. Uh, given uh, uh, you know your parapolitical sensitivities and analysis, uh, and without getting me or the Stoa canceled or suicided, uh, <laughs> we have done very well to not catch you. <laughs> you did, you did. Um, oh, any, any predictions of what's coming online, um, even in the in next month, but in the next uh, um, next years. Someone uh, we haven't mentioned who also deserves a shout out, I think, is um, Allison McDowell. And her site is called Wrench in the Gears. And it's too hard to explain in a short moment what she's up to, but she's studying intersections of finance and gamification and surveillance state stuff and military video games and, and basically looking to create economies or markets in a gamified augmented reality world as wild as that sounds um i think her work again not that every every single aspect or potential speculation she makes upon the data is necessarily going to pan out but i think she does a really admirable job of figuring out an, an element of the story that i think is really critical so i'd recommend her as someone to be looking towards yeah i don't know i can answer that question in in, in so many in so many ways I, I, th I think we're in a period where um you know this deep state deep politics whatever you want to call it uh, the octopus is is trying to is trying to it's showing its hand a little too much and and uh is waking a, a lot of people up to its actions and as it doubles down it becomes more and more coercive. It just becomes more and more obvious. And as, as the media continues just to endlessly lie and people to see it in front of them. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think we're in a, you know, in some sort of unveiling, you know, the, the word, the apocalypse is an unveiling. And I, I think, you know, I, it could get worse before it gets better, but I, I do think we're in a, in a really extremely difficult time for sure to be a human, but a really interesting one as well. So um, I'm looking, I don't know. It's going to be a heck of a next year, but. It's going to get, I can only say it'll get weirder, get used to the weird as normal, because it's going to weird and then weird on the weird. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Amen to the the weirding that's uh, happening. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so a lovely session, gents. Uh, I'll, I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but any kind of thoughts you'd like to leave us with here at the STOA? No, just thanks for having us here. I really appreciate your work. And um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. I second that. Thanks so much. Yeah. Beautiful. 
Yeah, so thanks uh, uh, again for coming on. Uh, love to have you back, uh, perhaps some more parapolitical machinations here at the, the STOA. Um, and uh, check out their website, Limited Hangout, uh, WTF, uh, Experiments in Ontological Flooding. And speaking of ontological flooding, tomorrow we have uh, the guy who coined that term, a para uh, anthropologist, Jack Hunter. He's going to come in at 12 p.m. Eastern time to have a session on that. So if you're interested in this session, I imagine you might like that one. Uh, so that being said, uh, um, son of Korg, Ezekiel73, and everyone else, thank you for coming to the store today. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank you.